Lee and uh, Dean McLean for this privilege of, uh, of being the future speaker in, in the last one. So I see the lids going down, so I will fast. Um, I feel a bit humbled uh, and insecure because uh, the vast majority of research in music that has taken place here uh, it far exceeds my own experiences in music research. Uh, I am a cardiologist uh, and I am a scientist in population health. So what I'm going to be coming at this from today is the physician perspective and the population health perspective. Big picture. Um, and uh, it's going to be mostly as a result of um, my own combination of sort of my own synthesis of, of existing literature, a little bit of, of, of my own research that I've done in collaboration with others, and perhaps a little bit too, too much personal anecdotes. But I think seeding together, it gives a perspective, and my perspectives are still evolving. I got interested in music medicine because of my own anecdote. Uh, I, I have experienced the euphoria of music composition. It's my love. And yet, as a practitioner and an evidence-based practitioner, I sort of have this schizophrenic type of relationship with myself where I feel that we should be holding music to the same standards as we do other therapies or we become a little disingenuous. So it's with this sort of schizophrenic relationship I emerge today. So I'm going to start with the synthesis of the literature, very briefly. It's clear that the number of publications in music and science, while a very low proportion of the overall literature published in Medline or PubMed, um, what is clear is that it's rising at a relative clip, almost two-thirds of all other combined medical literature in total. So we're clearly on a cutting edge of something. What is also my own observations that's clear in looking at this literature, and, and I think tonight is a bit of an exception to that, uh, but I think most of the literature you would, if you started dissecting it, would be uh, mechanistic proof of concept physiology. What do I mean by that? That we know a lot of stuff about how sound penetrates our brain. There's a lot of stuff out there about the way the brain lights up. A lot of data out there on frequencies and electrical, um, electrical responsiveness in brains. And there's also a lot of proof of concept. We've taken some of those neuroscientific physiologic parameters and we've coupled them with body physiology. Music, sounds, elicit certain blood pressure responses, heart rate variability, um, mood, anxiety. Mechanistic proof of concept physiology is very important. Their hypothesis generating and they bring worlds together. But we mustn't mix up one very important concept. Mechanism proof of concept physiology does not equate with mechanistic proof of concept pathophysiology. And the main difference, the main difference really, is that pathophysiology connotates an understanding of the final common pathway, a final common pathway that leads from a symptom to an outcome. Not multiple potential final common pathways. And that's my definitional difference of physiology to pathophysiology. But what do I mean by that? Well, one challenge with mechanistic proof of physiology is this. Brilliant copy, it made me cry. It was more moving than Martin Luther King's speech. But Harris, is only one thing I keep asking myself. Will it sell dog food? So, one important aspect of pathophysiology is understanding the endpoints and outcomes by which you're measuring. So, for example, heart rate variability is a very important me physiologic measure of autonomic regulation or dysregulation. Um, and it is a very important physiologic measure, but its pathophysiological importance is really only predictive in a subset of the population. 
those, for example, who've had recent heart attacks. Um, furthermore, there's been no therapy that's ever been targeted to heart rate variability to improve outcomes. So we have to be careful when we measure heart rate variability as an outcome. Is it relevant to really what we're trying to measure? Where there are synergies between physiology and pathophysiology, such as chronobiology, as a practitioner, I want to understand if resetting the biological clock is going to make me healthier. As a practitioner, I want to know all the ways I can reset the biological clock, which could be exercise, could be diet, could be nutrition, could be substance abuse control, be sleep apnea. But when we target music in there, in isolation, it both can become arbitrary. And as a practitioner, we like to rank things in order. We practice evidence-based guidelines. Where does music fall um, in ranking of priority with my other toolbox that I need to do to reset chronobiology? Very important. I'm not saying that music isn't important, but my Dr. Jekyll high and my Dr. Jekyll in me wants to know where. Where does it fall on, under the importance? A third challenge is what I call the endorphin bias. It makes us feel healthier, it makes us feel better, so it must work. This was a, um, a study in which Heidi and uh, a group actually uh, that we, we had embarked on a couple of years ago, which I'm just about to actually public, uh, sorry, finish for publication to send to you guys, so a little bit of it. But one of the things is we took the cardiac rehab population, by 200 consecutive patients, half graduates, half half current users, and we asked them how many of you utilized music with exercise and what do you think it did? So about, we divided the sample in half. Those that used music with exercise swore that its effects were positive. They were convinced that music made them healthier. They were convinced that music made their exercise tolerance better. But when we actually went to measure through self-report, these are just surveys, a validated health status questionnaire coupled within all these other questionnaires, we found no difference. So we mustn't over-embellish what we think music can do for us um, because of the endorphin effect. Okay, so who, who knows a show of hands who William Withering was or is? Anybody? Does anyone know what this... Foxglove and Dijoxin, great, from, from, the, uh, from, from our, our physician knowledge translation um, leader. And that is true. The interesting story, so William Withering has been credited to being one of the pioneers of Dijoxin, arguably one of our oldest drugs in cardiology. The story goes, actually, that a patient went to see him who was sick, and he couldn't do anything for this patient. So he sent the patient on the way. Did you know this story? And so the patient went actually to see Gypsy. This was in 1763. And the Gypsy took the plant extract and gave it to the patient, and the patient miraculously felt better. And then, about a few weeks later, saw Dr. Withering, who is an entrepreneur, who said, I've got something here. I want to know what's that plant extract, and I want to, I want to understand it, develop it, pioneer it, and, and distribute it. And so, that was an example where we have a plant with a whole bunch of different mechanisms, right? A whole bunch of different toxins that could have potentially therapeutic, and that was a circumstance that led itself to a therapy. Happenstance. What would he have done now today? He would have, he would have identified the final common pathway, let's say hypertension, renin angiotensin. He would have said, okay, to control angiotensin, I've got to develop a therapeutic strategy that hits that receptor to block the angiotensin and to therefore control blood pressure. So, 
we can see that proof of concept physiology can lend itself to therapies, but it's a bit arbitrary. And oh, by the way, 230 years later after that discovery, we realized that the Jackson really doesn't do that much for us, right? Doesn't save lives, doesn't, doesn't really improve our symptoms. So we must be careful about this. Okay, so who has it right? And I was delighted that so much uh, time has been given to music therapy because I think they are the closest to therapeutics in medicine. Music therapy takes a patient with a disease and needs to have an outcome. And they set a personalized goal and action plan, and they utilize music as a modulator to achieve their personalized goal and action plan. Perfect, perfect clinical storm for the treatment of disease. Um, one of the challenges, and I am, a, I am a huge proponent of passionate proponent of music therapy. I sit on the board of the Music Therapy Trust. But measuring impact is the biggest limitation. It's not conducive or hasn't been thought of, even though there's been a lot of research, how do we know what the value is? How can we convince a payer, for example, to subsidize music therapy? What do we have to do in that case? What is the return on investment? What is the social return on investment? Very difficult stuff to do. And I think it highlights one of the biggest challenges in research, medicine, and therapeutics. And that is something called, that we say in statistics, heterogeneity. Disease management is the closest thing I can equate to music therapy. I'm, I'm a cardiac rehabilitation physician. We give patients one-on-one -on -one programs, get them through exercise, some self-management, very individualized. And the biggest problem with that is that we see a lot of noise to signal ratio. The test results, if you look across studies, are kind of, kind of all over the place. Well, does that mean that we've hit the nail in the head and therefore give up? There is no way we can ever develop a therapeutic strategy if all we're going to find is heterogeneity. Is that what it means? Well, fortunately, I don't think that is what it means. And I think this is where medicine and music for therapeutics need to go, in addition to what we're doing. It's just a perspective. We measure, <clears throat> not my singing voice, we measure, <laughs> I need your card. We measure impact in the population, not by whether a drug works or not, not by whether disease management works or not. We measure it by something called the number needed to treat. Alan knows that. All the doctors know that. Number needed to treat is how many people we need to treat to save one life, right? The best therapies that we have, we might have a number needed to treat of 25, 20 to 25. That means, that means that 19 out of 20 or 24 out of 25 do not benefit, do not live as a result of that treatment. One does. That's the best we can do. How can we improve that? This is a relationship between treatment efficacy on the horizontal axis and number needed to treat on the vertical axis. The lower the number needed to treat, the better it is. It means we need to treat fewer people to save a life, or fewer people to improve quality of life, or chronobiology. And the horizontal axis is treatment efficacy. This is, does it work? This is if you take a pill and compare it to placebo, it's got a 20% reduction in improvement in mortality. If we take a music therapy intervention and compare it to no music therapy, see a 20% works, that's what efficacy means. And the fascinating thing about this relationship is that it's most governed by not whether it works or not but it's most governed by the patient population in whom we treat. Take a high-risk patient population and do something that doesn't work very well at all. Sorry, I'm like all over the place here. 
relative efficacy of 10%, which isn't overly dramatic, so it doesn't really work that great, but use it in a very high-risk population in purple, and look at how low your number needed to treat it. Versus take something that's really good, say 30% treatment efficacy, of, and, and do it on a population that is low risk, we've got a much higher number needed to treat. So this tells me that it's about as important about who we treat as it is about what we're doing. And I think one of the things that we need to embrace in holistic interventions like music is, number one, understand it from a pathophysiologic pathway, which means identifying what is that final common pathway. Not so much because physiology and pathophysiology don't merge, but because it focuses. It removes the foxglove analogy, and it centers into a therapeutic strategy. And I think, secondly, we need to keep our mind open that music is just one of, right? It's one of several therapeutic interventions in the toolbox. As a doc, I don't want to see people just focusing in on one therapy and having tunnel vision because I get suspicious. It becomes a little arbitrary. So we need to think about it and not over-exaggerate what the potential benefits of music is in relative terms to other interventions. But I think where the research from a population health perspective could go and could be very effective is to embrace the patient populations in whom we target and to embrace the environmental context with which we're exerting our therapy in. So in other words, taking a music therapy intervention and taking it from a hospital setting into a community setting might elicit a completely different NNT, right? Completely different impact on the population. Doing so on a high-risk cardiovascular patient who's just had a heart attack where you can measure HRV, heart rate variability, as an outcome, might be an appropriate way to now hone in on a population with a relevant point. So this is really what Vigor Projects is about. It's translating music to medicine using a variety of different ways, but it really focuses much more so on the patient populations and the environmental context than it does on kind of what the therapy is. Um, and a good example, one of the things I'm proud of, uh, and I'll, I, if there is time, uh, leave it to Lee, we do have a little clip of something a little more sexier and innovative that we've just done and had a performance part of Blue Review and Diane and Tom, uh, who's, who was all part of. But I think one of the one of the things I'm most proud about that actually seeded bigger projects was, was a lecture I gave a year before. And I do a lot of lunch and learns for employees in health and wellness. As a cardiologist, going into the employee sector is a really interesting perspective. About the 20 minute mark of all lectures, you start to see people stirring about, you start to see the lids set. So I was always trying to think of what's a cute little entertaining way that I could spice it up and give a little knowledge transfer to the audience. And one of the things that's always interesting, probably the best public health thing I could do, or we could do as a society next to stopping smoking, is train us all on CPR. Because studies have shown that communities that train communities, individuals in CPR, can raise the survival rate from a dismal 1% from an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest to 15%, still dismal, but that's 15-fold increase in survival. So I am cute. I start, okay, everybody get up. I'm not gonna make you do it, don't worry, because we've got the jazz thing happening and you'll get up there. And then I go, I go, I stretch, and then I start going like this, and I'm going to like, I'm going to 100 beats per minute, and then I start going like this, and people, it's a sign and says, and then I start going like this, and 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 like this, at 100 beats per minute, and I stop. And people are saying, this is so moronic. What is he doing? And I, I'm doing CPR. Hands-on CPR, 100 beats per minute, and that was kind of my entertaining way, and it was cute. Well, I get this call from a, an HR guy, says, one of the employees really wants to speak to you. I speak to this employee, and he says, you know what? I think I, the employee, I, mean, I saved a life. 
And I think it's because of what you did in the lecture. I said, what? Turns out, after this lecture, he was engaged to speak to his wife, who then, as a family, took a basic life support. And about six months after, he was on the squash court with his buddy, and two squash courts down was an arrest. And he was one of the first responders. And he, he elicited CPR, and he, apparently the patient survived, and he was, he was euphoric. That's a really far-reaching step to music and health promotion. But it does illustrate that we mustn't be constrained by what we think can work. There's a number of strategies. Keeping it broad-based, looking at a number of different ways in a number of different settings, sometimes to engage people, and sometimes, which is health promotion, and sometimes to actually intervene on people, will take different strategies. I think the encouraging aspect here is that we are now interdisciplinary. I think the path of physiologic pathways will come from the clinical perspective. I think marrying the physiology will be what will ultimately be able to make the stories come to life in a therapeutic manner. And I think as long as we don't overstep the bounds of what we can do um, and not overpromise, uh, I think we'll be very successful. Um, and I think uh, I'm going to stop there.